Although the topic of this talk is the conservation of crocodilians, a lot of the focus will be on the Nile crocodile. Um, as you've mentioned, I had the absolute good fortune to have been involved um, for almost 20 years in Nile crocodile management and research. So it's, it's a lot to do with, the, with my experience the last two decades. I must just say that this talk is not going to be too dry and scientific. It's going to be very much a visual overview of the work that I've been involved in. So, um, you know, just from the start, I want to warn you at some points of, you know, we got to pick up or maintain the pace. It's, it's, it's going to, we got to work through quite a number of photographs, but I hope, I hope that by showing this, um, I might be able to whet the appetite uh, for, for crocodile, crocodilian and Nile crocodile conservation in particular, because most people, you know, when they think about crocodiles um, and Nile crocodiles, they um, have various negative thoughts and reactions, and they're actually not aware of the, of the threats and the plight of our wild Nile crocodiles in Africa, in Southern Africa, and particular in South Africa. Right, so I'm gonna try and I'm aiming for 40 minutes. I might go a little bit over time, but, uh, but bear with me. So first of all, what we'll do is we'll pause um, and we'll look at the 25 species of uh, crocodilians that uh, we find today on the planet. It, it, it's a beautiful and a diverse group um, of, of species. We only have time to touch on two or three or four. I will at least mention all the African species. Then um, we'll look at morphology and really just at size because people have always been absolutely fascinated with, um, with crocodilians and the size that they, that they do attain. Ecology, um, we'll have to say something about ecology because this is really, really interesting. Um, you know, the way that crocodiles interact with the environment and that certain parameters like temperature just plays a role throughout the life history of, the, of these incredible animals. We'll have to say something about the history, um, about people and crocodiles many thousands of years ago. And then in order to conserve a species or a group of species, uh, we need to understand them. And we can only understand animals and plant species if, if we have budgets for research, if we have long-term monitoring programs. So all these things come into play to, at the end of the day, try to manage these animal species and plant species more effectively. I've mentioned that crocodiles, and particularly now crocodiles, are under increasingly and huge threats in South Africa as well as elsewhere. So we look at that. Um, in terms of the conservation status, many of you might be surprised if we get to the number of wild crocs that we are managing in South Africa or that are in South Africa in our rivers, lakes and dams. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll also look at, at the trends and the status there. And then finally, we're going we're gonna to be looking at the future, which um, I do believe uh, shouldn't necessarily be that bleak. Okay, so maybe let's start by saying that crocodilians belongs to the class of rep reptiles. I've put a number of photographs on there, um, turtles and chameleons and geckos and even the the Tuatara from uh, New Zealand, but in many ways, uh, crocodiles or crocodilians as a group are actually quite different to the class that they fit in. For an example, this is a wonderful statistic that I saw um, a while ago. Um, Chris, I'm just trying to see if I can get some of these. That's, that's, that's better. Um, wonderful statistic, and that is 80% of all reptile species on the planet weighs less than 20 grams, 80%, all reptiles. But on average, a hatchling crocodilian weighs at birth about five times that. So in many, many ways, just a very, very different uh, group of animals uh, compared to the rest of the, of the reptile class. Right, in terms of taxonomy, there are today 25 species of crocodilians worldwide. They belong to sort of three groups or families. There's still a bit of 
controversy around that. The first are the true crocodiles. There's 15 species, like this American crocodile is an example of. Then we have the next family, the alligators. Um, two of those, and then six caiman species, caimans mainly from South America. And then the gharial and the tumistoma, the gavialides. There's two species of those. Uh, very different looking animals. We'll just quickly say something about them later on. Then the a very, very first African crocodile I want to just say something about is also the croc that you will be most familiar with, which is indeed the Nile crocodile. Um, the Nile crocodile is, um, is found throughout Africa, really from, from, the, uh, the, from Egypt all the way down to northeastern Guzilu Natal. I'm just going to see if I can get my little pointer here. So it's got a a, a very interesting sort of um, distribution. Um, and then in 2011, a ancient cryptic lineage was discovered within the Nile crocodile. And that is this a new species, the West African crocodile, Crocodilius succus. Um, Crocodilius succus is more sort of the Western, it's this section here. And there's only really two countries where they overlap today, which is Uganda and Ethiopia. You can see that the Nile crocodile has extended its distribution sort of up uh, in Gabon and in Cameroon along the coastal areas there. So um, the, mainly the, the split came about in terms of the genetic differences. So they sampled more than 150 uh, specimens, uh, including some of the really on uh, old um, hatchlings that they found in museums and other mummified uh, crocodiles. And um, apart from the genetic differences uh, between the Nile croc and the West African crocodile, there's also substantial behavioral differences. This photograph was taken in West Africa. So the West African crocodile has got a very different predisposition. It's not as aggressive um, compared to the Nile crocodile. Also, in terms of its morphology, so shape and size, the most important thing here is the fact that the West African crocodile doesn't really grow a lot larger than sort of 3.2, 3.3 meters. So while the Nile crocodile gets a lot larger, which we'll say something about just now, the West African crocodile just do not grow as big. Also, maybe just quickly before I do move on, in terms of the behavior, um, this was actually also recognized by the priests in Egypt um, because all the crocodiles that they would kept in the palaces were all this particular species, the West African crocodile, not being so aggressive. Um, and uh, so that was not the, not the Nile crocodile. Right, moving on to some more African species. The African slender snouted crocodile, Mekistops, stops, very different. Um, a very different crocodilian altogether, uh, obligatory fish eater. It's found within the tropical rainforest of, of West Africa. Then there's another species that's been described so recently, it still doesn't even have a common name. Um, it's it's Mekistops uh, leprorhynchus. It's situated also in, in sort of central West Africa, a little bit more southwards, and uh, it actually doesn't overlap with um, with cataphractus or the slender snouted crocodile. Then the, the last true crocodile in Africa is the African dwarf croc. This is also quite a small animal. Um, the largest specimen, I believe, was about two meters. They don't really grow a lot bigger than about 1.7, 1.8 meter, and also a forested species found in the, the, the rainforest there of West, of West Africa and Central Africa. Um, there is there's four subspecies that's all in various stages of recognizing them as, as a separate species. Moving on from the true crocodiles to alligators and caiman, the American alligator found sort of in the south, southeastern United States, very well known, also an incredible success story in terms of, you know, just bouncing back from near extinction to about probably about four or five million alligators today and just hugely important in terms of the of the of the economical benefits to landowners 
Um, then we have another alligator on the other side of the world, the Chinese alligator, um, found in a, in a few rice paddies. And in actual fact, there's only about a few hundred of these animals surviving. So they are listed as critically endangered. Then uh, moving on to the black caiman, I'm just highlighting one or two mainly found in South, well, in South America, Brazil, Bolivia, Peru, and this, this animal actually can grow to well over four meters. So it is quite an impressive crocodilian um, and has been implicated also in a number of um, uh, you know, attacks on, on people. And then just very different is the Snidus caiman, a very small crocodilian indeed, heavily ossified, bony plates, uh, not, not the type of animal that you're going to be making handbags at all from. So very much a um, you know, small, again, a forested species. Um, and it just kind of highlights the difference within this with very, very diverse group. And then finally, the, the, the third uh, family, the gharial and the tumistema. This is the Indian gharial. The male has got this very prominent gar at the end of its nose. Um, also very prominent in mating displays. And then we have a female here yeah, at, the, at the bottom. Uh, also critically endangered, found in India and Nepal. And then the Tumistama, or the initially known as the false gharial, um, distributed in uh, um, Indonesia and um, Borneo and the Malayan Peninsula. So moving on to... Let me just do morphology. Nile crocodile, obviously, uh, one of the largest uh, species up there with the saltwater crocodile, which I'm going to say something about just now. Um, the Nile crocodile, like all other crocodilians, are sexually dimorphic. So males do grow a lot, a lot larger than females. With Nile crocodiles, males can grow up to about 5.5 meters or possibly even a little bit larger, but that is absolutely the exception. So even a four meter, um, and, you know, Nile crocodile can is considered quite a, quite a large specimen, but certainly in, uh, in areas like Kruger National Park, there's a number of individuals that are, that are well over five meters, um, but there's unfortunately not many populations where we have, um, those individuals remaining. Then the mean uh, female size at Lake St. Lucia is about 3.2 meters. This photograph of, uh, of mating just again just highlights the size difference between males and females. Okay, this is a really large male. The female has just got a head sticking up above the water, but it sort of just highlights the point that there are some vast differences in terms of size. The largest Nile crocodile skull um, was from a croc, uh, a Nile croc at Lake Chamu, um, and they've estimated based on total length and the head length ratio that this particular individual that Rom Whitaker is holding here in his hands in Ethiopia was, was over six meters in length. The largest uh, crocodilian skin that's ever been measured, modern crocodilian skin, was uh, drowned in 1980, it was a saltwater crocodile, um, Crocodilius porosus, and it drowned in a fishing net in Papua New Guinea, um, and it measured 6.2 meters. So that indeed was a truly impressive specimen. And then in 2011, uh, another saltwater crocodile was caught in the Philippines, got the name Lalong, named after one of the people that captured the, this a crocodile and unfortunately passed away that day due to uh, a cardiac arrest. And uh, so therefore they, and, you know, out of respect, they named him Lulong. Uh, Lulong was say 6.17 meters and weighed well over a ton. Unfortunately, um, two years later, it died in captivity, um, possibly due to stress. So it was stress related. Um, you know, they, people came to spew it and they drained the pond once a week. So, yeah, it was, it was probably, at the end of the day, it was the pneumonia and the cardiac arrest was, was all stress-related. So very sad. This is a, just another photo of Lelong on the day that they drained the pond to, so people can actually see him better. So he indeed was a very impressive specimen. 
Ecology, ocudalians all are ectotherms, so it just basically means that their body temperature follows the temperature of the environment, and throughout the life of the individual, it plays a hugely important role. Because of the fact that they are ectotherms and they can't maintain a constant body temperature like us, they need to thermoregulate. So they would typically bask um, on cool mornings on sandbanks, and they would then go and you know, in, in, in cold winter nights, they would go back into the water. So just seeking the optimal uh, thermal environment for them. So they do that um, behaviorally by moving, by sort of shuttling in and out of the water. And then it, 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 in terms of seasonal effect, that's obviously comes into play in a very, very big, a big way. Also, all true crocodilians can osmoregulate. So only the true crocodiles um, has got salt glands on their tongue, so they can osmoregulate. They can rid themselves of excess salt, specifically if they if they live in estuarine systems or even into the ocean. Having said that, um, there's some very recent research that has also indicated that even though the um, the American alligator um, can't osmoregulate uh, physiologically, they they do also move into estuarine systems and um, and, and you know, utilize those ecosystems as well, but then move back. So in many ways, uh, the Nile croc will, will always first osmoregulate behaviorally by moving uh, towards uh, freshwater pools uh, in, if the salinity is really, really high, like we've often experienced in Lake St. Lucia during droughts. Um, but if, if they need to, they can actually physiologically osmoregulate as well through those salt glands. Crocs are much more efficient uh, in terms of utilizing energy compared to um, a wild dogs and lions and leopards that's got to maintain constant body temperature. So crocodilians just generally are more efficient, but, but they do not have to maintain because they don't have, they don't have to maintain that body temperature. And then maybe just to mention that they really are predators of the water's edge. So crocodiles don't swim in deep water searching for prey. They wait, they, they ambush, they sit and wait at the water's edge, or they would use shallow water on the edge or, you know, leave the lake and, and look for shallow streams and, and seepages and because they're just much more efficient in terms of, of catching their prey. Uh, they don't sort of, you know, swim in, um, they are very, very uh, um, effective. They can sit at the bottom, you know, on a dark night. Um, and because of the uh, sensory organs around their face, they just got this ability to sense oncoming prey as well. So they, they really are predators of the water's edge. Then, like birds, all crocodilians hatch from an egg. This is a photograph of a female uh, at Lake St. Lucia. Um, the nesting season corresponds with the, the wet and the hot season. So uh, females, um, um, they lay their eggs in, uh, from about early November to mid-November. This is what a crocodile nest looks like. So you have the head on this side and then the tail on, on this edge. You can actually see as the croc is lying here, that's its neck um, looking around. And then I, I was kind of wondering if you could guess where the eggs would be, just about there. So normally the eggs would be here, sort of under the gula pouch of the female, under her throat, um, right here. So um, that's a crocodile's nest. So in South Africa, the mean clutch size is 48 eggs, not genes, but temperature of the sand uh, determines the sex of the hatchling crocodiles within that viable range of about 27 to 35 degrees centigrade. Um, the incubation period, almost three months or slightly over, very much again dependent on temperature. And then um, uh, Nile crocodiles, like a number of other, other true crocodiles, have got this female-male-female pattern of sex determination. So sort of your 
your cooler temperatures will have predominantly females, um, as well as your warmer temperatures will have, again, predominantly females, while your intermediate temperatures will have predominantly males. So not as clear cut, for instance, like the alligator, um, but this has also been described in a number of other true crocodile species. Then a couple of years ago, multiple paternity has been described now in a number of, of crocodilian species. This just means that uh, a female within a clutch of eggs, there will be hatchlings from a number of different males. So it's not just one male that's responsible for all the eggs in the clutch. In terms of historical context, in, and this is really focusing on Africa, so crocodiles and humans, they have co-evolved for hundreds of millions of years on the continent. Uh, we know that because there are um, human bones that's got teeth marks on, that were found in caves. So we know that crocodiles were definitely predating on people. And we also know that for millennia, uh, people also use crocodiles as food. Uh, so there is this almost like a, a, an instinct, a, a natural instinct of crocodiles to actually try and get away uh, from people. And they are not just, you know, uh, uh, immediately enticed to, to feed on people. So early hunter-gatherers had very, very little impact on populations, but everything changes with colonialization. Um, modern firearms was responsible for the slaughter and hunters, soldiers exterminated hundreds of thousands, if not millions of, of crocodiles, you know, throughout Africa during colonialism. In the early 19, in the early 1800s, um, people starting to realize that the skin of crocodilians are, or not all crocodilians, but at least some of them are incredibly good for, for making leather boots. Um, in the American Civil War, um, there was a number of uh, wild alligator um, were harvested for, for boots and saddles, very durable. And then after the Second World War, the slaughter were just expedited throughout Africa. And um, it, it really at, at a very, very high, at a very high level. And this is the reason why um, on the one hand, and I'll say something about this now, um, it's for the skin. And now today, this skin trade plays a hugely important part in the conservation of, 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 of crocodiles, not just Nile crocodiles, but all the crocodilians that's involved in the skin trade. And, and it's so important, you know, for, for, these, for these to be sustained. By 1971, the Crocodile Specialist Group um, was formed at its first meeting. The reason really was that almost all species were endangered and uh, a number of populations were literally on the verge of extinction. The Crocodile Specialist Group was really, really important in lobbying and, and getting conservation managers, cro you know, crocodilian managers, specialists starting to do research. Um, and at the end of the day, getting all these species also on the, uh, the Cytex Appendix 1 category, which means there's no trade. At that time, the, the philosophy was total hands off, no use, total protection. Also, at that same time in the early 1970s, in KwaZulu Natal, a guy with the name of Tony Pooley started to uh, do reintroductions and uh, played a hugely important role in terms of the conservation of those populations. Then, by the mid 1980s, um, the conservation, the protectionist approach paid off, and there was recovery seen. This is in an African context specifically in Zimbabwe and in Mozambique and many other African countries. And the, the, the management philosophy was then changed to sustainable use where people were involved in the, in the conservation of the resource. And in fact, it played a hugely, and to this day, play a hugely important role in terms of the livelihoods of people. Right, so in terms of monitoring and research, very important to try and um, get an understanding of what's going on with these populations. 
I'm going to quickly run through this. Aerial survey is obviously really important, specifically where you can't put a boat on. Nesting surveys, um, also from the air even, using, using uh, paragliders. Um, there's various things you can do. You can individually uh, identify these nesting females. Um, you can tag the nests in the tree and number them and get, get a sense of your reproductive uh, segment of your population. Spotlight survey is very important, specifically to quantify your smaller size classes. Also, um, often it's very difficult. There's huge visibility bias and even observer bias with aerial surveys. So spotlight surveys do continue to play an important role also for working out correction factors that you can then uh, from then on only carry on with the aerial service, which often is just a lot more easier logistic, logistically, specifically in your lotic or your river systems. In terms of getting these animals to do research, you've got to catch them. There's a whole, a whole range of different alternative methods. I'm going to fly through a couple. Traps is, the, is one way that you can do it um, by setting things like a bamboo or a fishing rod. Um, this is always baited traps. This is a camera trap that took a photograph of this male in the Mapati River that uh, that took this bait. And there's a trigger mechanism right here. So of course, uh, you know that this happens uh, half past seven at night. Um, this is the Mapati River again, a baited trap. Uh, you you don't need a big cage. I'll show you a photograph or two of a big cage. What is important here is your self-locking mechanism. So we import these snares from the states, and then you can you can bait them. Not and you don't need a lot of meat. And by doing that, you can uh, you know increase your sample size. This is a more conventional cage trap used in a number of provinces. Then there's another way that can be very effective where you use fishing rod and reel with a small weighted treble hook. Um, you can operate both during the day and at night. So you kind of cast over the animal and then you, it, it hooks into the softer parts of the crocodilian or the croc, in this case, the Nile croc. And it often doesn't really go in as deep as the barb. So we close the barb and it goes in for a few millimeters. You've got to keep the tension on but that allows you then to get close enough to the animal. Just by the way, this has gone all through ethics and there is very little, if any, pain that the animal feels. And then that it allows us to put the noose around the animal's neck. If you catch on land, if you're lucky enough to get crocodiles, uh, not in the main lake, but in isolated pools, you can do that just by placing a, the noose tied to rope and a pole over the neck of the crocodile, and then you on that, so that particular individual that was all out of a pool. Often you can get a chance uh, when the water is not that deep um, to try and get uh, to surprise the animal by sort of running towards it. Uh, and if you're lucky and you're quick enough, you can get that noose around the neck of the animal. This is you and Carl again running in that animal. Um, and there they got it around the neck and then it allows you to, to bring the animal and to start processing the animal. This is the cable sticking out on, on this side here. Um, then if you're lucky enough to have one or two water box carcasses like we had this particular day, you can work up three or four animals. Um, as long as the water isn't too deep, too quickly, you can get that noose around the neck successfully and then process the animal that was that particular day uh, in Catalina Bay at Lake St. Lucia. From the boat, same thing, a pole and a noose. Uh, unfortunately, you know, crocs do become skittish and uh, it, it often work well for the first few times and not, not so much thereafter. That's why you've got to have a whole diverse range of catching techniques. This is throwing rope, slightly large, but you can use the same size barb where you throw over the croc and you retrieve it and uh, it just catches the animal somewhere where the skin is slightly softer and you can, you, can, you can bring it in and then put the noose around the neck. This is actually taken in Luwandi National Park in Malawi. Then uh, crocs do utilize burrows. Um, that's part of the ecology. Um, and then if you tie bamboo to that, 
to that small little hook. Again, you, if you're lucky, you can actually get the animal and then just haul it out of its burrow so you can then process it. But once you've got the animal, you can start getting ready to collect data. Uh, the main theme is always safety, um, specifically when the animal is covered in mud or when you have rubber ducks and not steel or you know, aluminum boats. Um, so safety is always, is always up there. Um, and uh, you secure the mouth of the animal. Once the mouth is secured, very important is to secure the back legs. Otherwise, the animal will just start, specifically if it's a big animal, it'll start walk with you. Then data collection, we normally take blood, take urine, and a whole suite of morphometric measurements to try and ascertain various parameters from these animals. You can tag them. You want to get a sense of population size with mark recapture, um, analysis. You can put satellite tags on these animals and find out where they're going. The, there's a couple of people that's listening in, participants like Donnie and Sam. I see that's, been, that's, that's also in these photographs. Um, um, because we have collaborated quite a bit in the past and assist, assist each other with these techniques, etc. So in terms of threats, I'm just going to fly through a couple of threats. Snaring is obviously a big one. Everywhere where there's crocodiles, you get crocodiles that's getting caught up in snares. This is illegal hunting at Pongalapur Dam, nest destruction, opportunistic killing, this is quite difficult to see, but this is a Tongaland trap at Lake Sabai. So it's an enclosure of sticks with an entry point here. And then they use, like in this case, the head of a cow and the crocodile will walk through here and it will get, uh, it will get the, the wire, the wire which you can see right here within this black circle around the neck. And as it then moves towards that piece of meat, the animal will then snare itself this is a nesting female that's been killed on a nest at Lake Sabai. Witchcraft, so targeted killings for Muti and witchcraft. This is at Lake St. Lucia. Uh, the tongue is removed, fat's removed, um, uh, all, all sorts of body parts. These are, this is a female on uh, the nesting grounds, again at St. Lucia. And that's a big worry because, you know, once people know how to get to these nesting grounds, uh, you know, during the nesting period, up to three months, they they basically have these crocodilians quite far from the water. Baited hooks, also not that common as yet, but but more common in other populations. This was at Lake St. Lucia, where they would tie meat around the hook, and then the crocodile will eventually just die from internal injuries if it actually managed to break the rope. Otherwise, it will be there, and the people will just haul it in. Boat mortalities at St. Lucia also uh, can be a problem. Um, gill nets throughout Africa where there's crocodilians and there's people, you know, crocodiles do die in gill nets, especially the younger ones. Um, then at St. Lucia, uh, Cromelina odorata on the nesting sites, Dr. Alison Leslie described this many years ago. So two things is important here. Firstly, the females physically cannot construct a nest because of the, the, the fibrous roots of this particular uh, plant species. And then secondly, where they do manage to actually make a nest, you can see this is all chromalina here to the left and the right. That's the actual nest cavity. The, the, the shading effect of the plant could actually influence uh, embryo mortality, if it's too cool, the embryos won't hatch, or it can also influence the sex. Prolonged droughts, as we have at St. Lucia, have, have a role to play, and uh, we, we do see crocodil crocodiles, now crocs losing condition, and then also lead um, uh, accumulation within, within crocs, mainly um, uh, males, uh, male, male crocodiles, now crocodiles at St. Lucia, they they pick up uh, these, as you know, these stomach stones. This is a stomach of a, of a dead croc. Uh, so you can clearly see the stomach stones. There's some glass. There's a spark clock as well. And then here you can see the remains of some lead sinkers. So this crocodiles do that throughout Africa. They pick up these gastrolith or these stomach stones. And then at a place like St. Lucia, they get this lead 
in their stomach. And that lead is then that goes straight into the blood and into the tissue and into the bone. And it causes huge, huge problems. It's, it's, it's very, very toxic. And then also habitat destruction, of course. So in terms of the conservation status of Nile crocs, um, throughout Africa, a study in 2008 was a meter population study, basically found that in most populations throughout Africa, um, crocod croc Nile crocodiles are declining. Um, they are declining. There's one or two exceptions. Um, in South Africa, the status is vulnerable. So 1978, 88, 2014, and the latest um, assessment, I think, was in 2017. Um, it's all vulnerable. Also, in Appendix 2 species, it's threatened and protected. In 1992, Dave Blake and Niels Jacobson estimated the number of wild crocs in South Africa over 1.2 meters, because that's sort of the size that you that you can see from an airplane or a helicopter, um, it was, was 8,500. And the most recent estimate um, is, is about 7,700. And as I said, in most of these populations, unfortunately, the, the crocodiles, the Nile crocs are declining due to all these aforementioned threats that I've just mentioned. And then finally, I think I've got two slides left. The future. So. If we maintain the status quo, so things, if management philosophy carries on the way that, 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 it, that it's going on, specifically where people and crocodiles share water resources, the likelihood of local extinction is almost 100%. So in all those water bodies, the Nile crocs will most likely be extirpated. Where you have... Um, you know, conservation areas like Kruger National Park and to some extent Lake St. Lucia, where people can be separated from crocodiles, um, this, this philosophy can work. Uh, it's by far the easiest way um, uh, to physically separate people and crocs. Um, but uh, in, in areas where people um, you know, need access to water in areas where there aren't any fences or where fences have been cut down. Um, it is impossible. It is impossible to re-erect those fences. Um, and, and therefore, this would not be a, a good philosophy. Strict protection has worked really well in, um, in the Northern Territories of Australia with the saltwater crocodile, the same with, with the, allig the American alligator. Um, but the problem in, in, in a South African or in an African context is that we just don't have the budgets. Uh, we don't have the staff. We don't have the boat fuel. Um, you know, we, we just do not have the number of people to enforce these very strict protectionist approaches. So. Also, since 1994, the whole philosophy in conservation has changed a lot. The, the, the fences have become a lot more porous. Um, they've recognized that people living next to these animals really should be um, at, at the front line of their conservation and should be partners um, in, in their conservation. So, and that's the last point really uh, is is the way that we can go about doing this is, is called sustainable use or conservation through incentives. And, and the basic philosophy there is very simple. It is to create direct and tangible benefits for the people living next to the crocodiles, the people sharing the water bodies with the crocodiles on a daily basis. So there's got to be a very clear link between having those crocodile populations um, and receiving benefits. Um, therefore, crocodile farms, as important as they are, are really not are, are not really helping here. We need those wild populations to be to be conserved. So they uh, there's no point in having a croc farm next to a river or a, or a wild lake with wild crocodiles in. The people need to protect the wild crocs, and by doing that, and by knowing they're going to be receiving a benefit, for instance with a ranching program where you ranch or you harvest a certain number of the nests and the people then 
get the benefits from the sales of the hatchlings, or you could even have a nearby facility like at Lake St. Lucia, where those hatchlings or where the eggs are transported to, and the people can actually share in the in, in the benefits in a very real way. And this is also where the croc industry can partner up and you can get crocodile farmers involved um, because the, the really the philosophy here is to protect the wild animals um, in, in, uh, um, and, and having, and, and having the, the local people do that. Reintroductions, yes, of the, the problem with this philosophy is you need a lot of crocodiles in water bodies to allow you to have the benefits of all those eggs. So you might need to reintroduce those depleted populations and that can be very controversial. So it's got to be, it's, in many ways, it's a political decision first. You've got to get the buy-in of the people. There's got to be a well-formulated scientific a restocking strategy. Um, that's, you know, and, uh, and, and at the end of the day, you just cannot do this if the people don't buy into this as a concept because there is no fences. Alternative, unfortunately, for um, all the populations that, that does not have fences, they, they certainly doesn't seem to be any alternative. Um, and the likelihood of those now crocodile populations going extinct is, 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 is very, very, very real. These are some acknowledgements. Thank you. That's my story. Thanks a lot, Chris. Um, and I just want to acknowledge all these institutions. I see I actually don't have sandparks here. Apologies. Um, and, uh, and, and the various people that's also contributed to photographs. Thank you, Zander, for a fascinating talk. Um, when I first read the book of um, Peter Beard, Eyelids of Morning, I thought the pictures were photoshopped. Um, am I muted? No. No, you're, um, you're live. And uh, until I got to, to um, Lake Turkana, I had to wear adult nappies. I've never seen crocodiles so big. Um, why are they so particularly conspicuously large in the rift um, of Ethiopia and Turkana? Dave, thank you so much. Yeah, it is uh, indeed a very interesting situation. Also, uh, while my, my first initial reaction would be um, perhaps a combination of, of, of the climate, so the fact that it is really, really warm up there, and perhaps food source. Um, my understanding is that there are a lot of fish in Lake Takana, and uh, the crocodiles, you know, when they eat well, they possibly uh, grow really well, like we know. Also, I do believe from work that I've seen from Alistair Graham that did the study there, his master's at Lake Takana in the 60s, um, they've even documented, uh, you know, individuals um, nesting more than once a year, which, which I'm not sure has been really documented in other further southern populations. So it, I, I suspect it's, it's all to do with climate and, and the fact that perhaps also because up until quite recently, those crocodiles were really protected, although the Takana didn't really, you know, like the crocodiles at all, I believe. Um, but maybe just uh, on that same note, uh, what, what, what I fi find very uh, disturbing is that a, a population which is thought to be about 12,000 in, in the early 1960s has gone down to, you know, perhaps as, as few as 1,000 or 1,500. We've been trying really, really hard to get some sense of the status, but like with many other African countries, we really battle to get uh, people, champions, to, to, to give us that type of information because very few of those agencies have got budgets to count crocodiles. So that's a classical example of, of which, which was thought to be the, the largest Nile crocodile population within a single water body that's, you know, that has declined dramatically. Um, but yeah, so to be quite honest, I, that, that would be my, my feeling that the temperature, yeah. 
Okay, the next uh, person up would be Sabila Guzman. After that, we'd have Christine and then uh, Jan. Mm. Sabila? Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, thanks so much, Zanda. Um, yeah, it was a very interesting talk. Um, you were saying um, that is something that I think has been known that um, when a crocodile female lays a clutch, the gender is determined, uh, you know, whether how many males or females will hatch is determined by the temperature of the sand um, or where the clutch is. Is there any indication with you know, if you believe in climate change and rising temperatures, um, that the ratio, the gender ratio actually is becoming skewed in any way? Or is it pretty much the same? I mean, you said the females um, at the lower temperature range, mm. at the higher temperature range, well, you will have females in, intermed in the intermediate temperature range, you have males. But, but is climate change or higher temperatures um, having an effect? I, thanks for that question. I, I think it, it most definitely will in the long term have an effect because temperature does play such a key role. Specifically also if you look at the, the rate of change. So this global warming that we're talking about is not happening over thousands of years but it's happening within a lifetime or two or three. So I suspect I, I have not seen any sort of uh, scientific evidence as yet in, in terms of crocodilians, but I'm sure there's a number of studies that are all focusing on this particular aspect, as well as other reptiles like, uh, like, like, you know, like uh, um, marine turtles, where this mm -hmm. comes into play, uh, except uh, you know, turtles can move around, I think, more freely than now crocodiles, for instance, that are contained. Uh, you know, most populations are very fragmented. There's very few linkage areas between these uh, conservation areas. So crocodiles can't move nearly as freely as they used to. So I think it's, it's a very important area of study. And I think it will definitely, most definitely uh, come into play, uh, potentially even having drier, you know, uh, uh, consequences for some populations. Of course, remember you have Nile crocodile populations from Egypt to northeastern KwaZulu Natal. And mm. in northeastern KwaZulu Natal, at the sort of southern extremity, you have very cool temperatures compared to tropical Africa that we just talked about, you know, like Tukana, et cetera. So even within the species, there are huge variation. Uh, then I'm, I'm just thinking of, for instance, Zimbabwe, with some of those highlands, Lake Ngezi, where some crocodiles. Uh, they are successfully nesting, although it takes them 30, almost 40 years to reach sexual maturity because it's so cool. So temperature has got a very complicated, I think, um, way that it, at the end of the day will manifest in particular populations. But most certainly, there are going to be some, potentially some dramatic changes. But I suspect it's going to be more medium term and not something that you're going to necessarily pick up in, in five or even 10 years, but I might be wrong. Mm. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Zander. The next uh, question, Christine Lepay. I'm unmuting you, Christine. Thank you, Chris. Um, thanks, Zander. That was um, so comprehensive and you have a fantastic delivery that uh, is very captivating. Um, so my question is, um, I found it quite shocking, um, and I'm sure we all do, um, to hear that the numbers are quite low in South Africa. Um, seven and a half thousand is a very small number for such a large country. And of course, uh, the South African population is a very special population in that it is the most southern most um, population of Nile crocodile on the continent. So when you went through your list of uh, possible solutions, um, you know, engaging communities, I mean, we've obviously got land uh, loss as well, habitat loss. Um, do you have any information on whether a BMP, this Biodiversity Management Plan under the NEMBA, under the Biodiversity Act in South Africa, um, has any, has, has, have there been any progress on maybe putting the Nile crocodile forward as a species for consideration? 
um, because through a BMP, um, there are management and action plans affiliated mm. with, which will obviously um, generate bu uh, budgets and funding so that we could actually perhaps mm. try and mitigate some of that, uh, that population loss. Yeah, thanks, Christina. It's, it's a very good point. One of our biggest challenges with the conservation of Nile crocs in South Africa is the fact that we have, you know, three or four provinces. Uh, we've got Northwest, we've got Mpumalanga, we've got Limpopo, and we've got KZN. And we have croc wild crocs in each one of these provinces. And we have a very different conservation approach. Uh, there's not a uniform approach. There's unfortunate, unfortunately often quite little communication flowing between provinces. There are definitely exceptions um, in terms of, you know, uh, we've been working, and I know Mpumalanga and Limpopo has been working a lot with sand parks, so there's been a lot of collaborative work. But I agree what we do need is that almost a, a, a country-specific focus in terms of actions, priorities, how do we deal with, for instance, not only uh, decreasing populations, but also things like human crocodile conflict, which is in some provinces, like I'm just thinking now from, you know, Northwest is becoming more and more of a problem. And I haven't even mentioned human croc conflict just because of time constraints. So I agree. I think we need a, a, a centralized approach, having, you know, a, a biodiversity management plan for the species, getting, you know, a lot of specialists, conservation, not only scientists, but managers around the table, formulating action plans, and then having a sort of good communication between all role players, uh, you know, and, and sort of taking the conservation of the species really sort of to a next level, because that's what we need. We are too fragmented in South Africa at the moment, unfortunately, I think. Thanks, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the next, the next person up would be uh, Jan Jacobs. Uh, Jan, uh, you have a question. Yes, thank you. Can anyone, can everyone hear me? Perfectly, thanks, Jan. You're good. All right, awesome. So, I'm now currently ta stationed at Rato Game Reserve. I'm actually doing interpretation work here, but at the same time, I'm actually conducting a human crocodile conflict study. Now. I'm curious as to whether Zander can tell me whether they, what I'm about to say, what am I going to ask, has some basis in reality. Now, a lot of the older people who live here, who know the area, have told me that in the 1950s, they used to be able to swim here in the Limpopo River, even though they knew there were crocodiles there, in super tubes, which they call them. But as some of you might know, Zander will definitely know, in 2013, there was a huge flood here. And as a result, thousands of the of the crocodiles, the mostly the ones that were ready for slaughter, but also some big breeders, were um, have escaped. And now there's still now there's still a lot of them out there, even though they caught recaptured thousands of them. So it, according to them, it's not dangerous any. It's it's dangerous now because there are too many crocs there. Can that truly really happen? Because I've heard certain places in Africa where there are not crocodiles, the crocodiles there allegedly leave people alone. You can safely swim there and in other places, they're too dangerous. Now, is that possible, that variation that where, you, where the crocs are so skittish for people, they'll avoid them even if they go swimming there? Is there any evidence suggest that? Mm. Um, it, it's kind of a difficult question, Yanni, because, I mean, at the end of the day, what we don't need is people getting, you know, attacked by crocs. So I do know um, that there are some areas I've heard, for instance, like Beringo in Kenya, where there's hardly ever been a croc attack. Uh, and and the, one of the hypotheses was there's so much fish that crocs aren't, they don't think of people as a food source. Um, but I also know that when, when an owl crocodile gets over like three and a half, four meters, you know, it, it's, it, you know, I think to a large extent, it, it will see humans as, as a food source. But also remember, I did mention to you uh, early on in the talk that crocs and people have co-evolved over many millions of years. And I've, on a number of occasions with Donnie and Sam and Kruger have witnessed 
the fact that you come over a little hill and then when that big five meter croc sees you it disappears into the water within a number of seconds you know uh, and that's that's at sort of four or five hundred meters away so i think there's definitely that that thing that wild crocs have got this healthy respect for people um on the one hand and on the other hand yes when you have farm crocodiles going into a river system potentially that could be quite catastrophic because those animals have lost that natural fear almost you know of humans um although i know that a lot of these escape crocs do swim back they do swim back to the farm they get back to the farm a couple of weeks later you know very uh, in bad body condition so we know we've we've actually proven that also with Nile crocs is that they home back um you know uh, so we've done that at St Lucia as well so we we know that they got this navigational ability maybe not the smaller ones um uh, but that's anyway uh, not ever a good thing to have your farm stock or almost contaminating your wild population so that's that's very a very bad and a very unfortunate situation that's actually happening more and more in south africa unfortunately but just yeah, so so it's 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 difficult in the early 1950s maybe the crop den population density might have been a lot lower you know um and people perhaps were swimming in those uh, rapids so you know once you're in a rapid and it's it's sort of fast flowing shallow water you can still do it relatively safe but i, I wouldn't venture into the deep pools below the rapids you know when there are sort of 3 and a half 4 meter you know wild crocs uh, you, you will be taking a chance thank you very much uh, nanda i think the next uh, question comes from papa harof papa i'm going to um unmute you and then just if you can turn your camera a little bit so we can see you please papa uh, i i'm not sure. can you hear me we can yes, hear you perhaps. okay good thanks um i'm not sure how i can put my you on are you muted again just um, muted you... yourself again unmute okay okay Now there we go yeah. yeah just ask the question papa okay bother. thanks yeah um i i've got a, a few questions thank you zonda i'm fascinated by crocodiles um i'm situated at the fossil park on the west coast and one of the few um animals that we haven't uh found here it's a 5 million year old site is crocodiles and 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 we think the conditions were warmer and wetter on the west coast 5 million years ago but my, i've always postulated that they weren't here then because thing because the west coast was already getting too cold um they 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 have been found as fossils at the mouth of the orange river dating back to 20 million years ago so so that's the oldest date for them on the west coast um when they so um so i I've, i've wondered also you know crocodiles go back go way back in the fossil record so they must have key survival strategies do do you do you have any ideas on that um so that and then uh, i've got two other questions can i maybe just uh, just uh, thanks for that um but, but i just want to check um we uh, um there was a paper published not too long ago earlier this year in the um uh in in the South African Journal of Science I think we we looked at um Nile crocodile uh tracks at Gerekes uh, Punt near Wilderness and I believe that I saw that there were tooth that was supposedly crocodile teeth were found in the west coast but it's never been confirmed i mean it has sort of been confirmed there's a publication out on that i think also in the south african journal of science i yeah. might might be incorrect but i i remember asking um around and trying to see if there's a way that we can actually do testing on those teeth because they are in a museum somewhere but yeah so that that is that uh, they they might actually not be crocodile teeth and and yeah. but in terms of i think any strategy with with crocodilians per se will revolve around temperature so you are going to have this fluctuations where you have these cooler wetter and warmer conditions spanning thousands millions of years and you are going to 
you know, quite likely have a regression and a, you know, a movement distribution changes. Um, and crocodiles, like even the Nile crocodile, can move up and down the coast. So it's got the ability to to move and to enter estuaries. We know in the very few people actually know that in the in the uh, in the Eastern Cape, in the Trans Sky, there are crocodiles. Uh, there's three. There's two two adults and a sub adult, and we know they do this what's known as estuary hopping, where they go out the Mendu and they go into the Bashi, and they go back again. So they were released by Tony Pooley in the 1980s, but. But yeah, and but the same is true for 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 the, the west coast. You know, uh, Cameroon, Gabon. There, there's a lot of uh, Nile crocs there that do move into the ocean. And of course, the saltwater crocodile is the perfect example from northern Australia all the way to India. Um, but but that's the perfect marine animal. You know, that's totally adapted to life in the ocean. Yeah, but is it true that they can burrow very deep and and sort of um, um, shut down for for years at a time. Yeah, well, I mean, I I, I can d definitely. I mean, burrowing behavior has been described. I think for most, uh, if not all, crocodilian species, we've seen burrowing behavior. You know, at, at a very large scale at St. Lucia, at Lake St. Lucia, it, to a large extent, depend on the, the the geology. You know, they can't burrow in too sandy soil. They, they yeah. need, you know, a certain type of substrate to burrow in, but that's well described. And certain species like the, uh, which I've talked about very briefly, the, um, the African dwarf croc is actually quite a terrestrial species. At night, it would do forage uh, far from water. Uh, it utilizes burrows very extensively. Um, mm -hmm. So they do burrow. Um, I know that in times of drought, for instance, at Lake St. Lucia, uh, they, they, crocodiles go into burrows and they could sit there for a very, very long time, as long as there's food. So we had a satellite transmitter on a female that were localized exactly like this on the eastern shoreline of Lake St. Lucia within swamp forest. And that particular female was, was isolated in a small little pool with freshwater seepage uh, coming down the eastern shores. And and uh, not only did she feed sufficiently to stay alive, she actually feed so well that she was able to reproduce two consecutive years, which mm. is quite unlikely with wild crops. So she obviously had a good spot there. There were plenty of bush pig and red diker and bush buck and even art fog we got on camera traps there that would go to the water and she managed to, you know, feed on them. So they definitely do go, but also I know at the same time, and Dani and Sam can maybe come in here if they want to, but there are definitely cases. I think it was in the Shingwetsi River uh, uh, during the most recent drought in Kruger where there was a number of dead crocs found, you know, when the river dried up. So it's not always possible for them to burrow and to yeah. then, uh, you know, sort of get them through that, that time, that hard time. But they can, to a large extent, shut down and, be very conservative, but they do need, you know, food and, and water. Otherwise, they're just going to lose body condition eventually. Yeah. Thank you. That's wonderful. Um, and then the, 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 West, the West African crocs, you said they're, they're not aggressive. So uh, is, is there less animal-human conflict there, or, or are their populations uh, better? Yeah. So, I mean, I... I um, Unfortunately, Matt Shirley is not is not here uh, taking part um, because he's he's got a big program there looking um, you know at 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 the slender snout at the two species. But in terms of Crocodilia succus, the West African crocodile, as you're referring to, all indication is that this animal is just a lot less aggressive. There are human crocodile conflict issues in West Africa. Um, they they you know it's it's it, there's definitely some cases that's been recorded that I'm aware of, but generally it's a complete, it seems to be, uh, you know, to a large extent, a different animal completely than the Nile croc. It doesn't grow as large. So just that in itself, you know, 3.2 meter and a four and a half meter animal are very different individuals. So the fact that the, the West African crocodile seems to be so much, sort of limited to about three, three point, maybe 3.5 meters, already, you know, um, is an indication that you can expect less human crocodile conflict. 
but you're possibly going to still have livestock conflict and um, you know conflict with pets and other animals. So uh, so so and, and young kids, children, um, you know, might. Uh, but the photographs that I showed were taken um, in in West Africa in in, um, um, in in a place where there's a where the, 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 the West African crocodiles are fed. So it's tourist attractions, you know, they, they're not hungry, they're constantly mm -hmm. fed. People sort of stroke them and sit on them. You know, it's, it's almost, and they, this has been going on for hundreds of years, but it to some extent is slightly unnatural. You know, it's not too many other places where you do that with, mm -hmm. with that type of interaction with crocodiles as what the priest would have had in those temples in Egypt, I guess, where, where they were interacting with the crocodiles. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. Hello. Thank you very much. Yeah. I just want to check, uh, Rod, before you go into the next question, I'm unmuting Dani. If he wants to come in, I'm not sure. Uh, so, Dani, you can just say yes or no, um, except unmute, or because you did refer to them, Zander. No, not coming in, so they're not going to. Yeah, Dani, would you like to come in? Thanks, uh, uh, Chris. Thanks, Anna, for the interesting talk. No, uh, the question around crocodile burrowing in, in, in Kruger, uh, I think Zander mentioned during the droughts we had here in 92 and the recent 2014 one. So th they can last uh, without open water for a while, but eventually they, 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 they do die. And, and during these uh, severe droughts, we do see a, a significant number of crocodile mortalities. Mm. Although in our perennial rivers during the last drought, uh, where we had lots of animals dying, lots of hippo carcasses. It actually seemed that, uh, that this past drought did, did most of the populations quite well. And we've seen the populations recover a bit after the drought. Thank you. Thanks, Donnie. Okay, the next, uh, next up would be Janssen Davies. Um, after that would be Campbell Scott. Janssen, you have a question? Thank you, Zonda. Well done. A fantastic talk. Thank you. Uh, just a quick update for us, please, on the uh, crocodile deaths uh, in the Olifants River some years ago. What is the current status? Have we finally found the culprit and have we mitigated that problem? Thank you. Uh, thanks, Janssen. We should actually go straight back to the previous speaker, ask Dani Pinar to maybe give us an update. <laughs> no, I mean, I can maybe just briefly say, uh, Janssen, that... Um, uh, my understanding, Dani uh, and Sam can can maybe just correct me if if I'm if I'm if I'm wrong. That the 2008 event was you know was was a was mortality possibly I think there was 270 carcasses found. It could have been up to 450 uh, adults. A uh, number of sub adults or juveniles probably were never never recovered. But uh, that was sort of an acute event that that did play toe, it asymptote out. And even though for the following years, there were still a number of crocodiles found with this disease called pansteatitis or yellow fat disease, um, it certainly has never been at that same level as in 2008. But also take into um, consideration the fact that if you lose 450 or even close to maybe 500 crocodiles, you know, just by having lost all those animals in the system, you could also expect fewer mortalities the next year. So um, my understanding is that it's a very complex, um, there's a lot of drivers uh, that, that result in pansteatitis. Pansteatitis is a nutritional disease. So it's not, pollution has got a, it's got a, uh, a link to pansteatitis. For instance, in Loskop Dam, you have this acid mine drainage, the, the tilapia die, the crocs, you know, bench on the tilapia, and you have this polyunsaturated fatty acids that basically overwhelms the 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 the, the, um, the, the immune response of the animals, and it depletes vitamin E, and then the crocs goes into sort of a cycle of of, of inflammation and eventually dies of of, of classical pansteatitis. Now you can get that same kind of a dynamic in a different way where you have eutrophic blooms. So like in Kruger National Park with the Olifants River, the raising of the Massengir Dam wall, or in times where you have standing lentic systems, you've got uh, you know, typical eutrophic blooms, cyanobacteria, and you have um, filter feeders like silver carp and tilapia binging on that sort of a, um, 
that in, uh, that uh, um, uh, you know that conditions and then have crocodiles feeding on them, then that's also why you see the fish have got a natural, they've, they've evolved with this polyunsaturated fatty acids that you get in the algae and in the, in the cyanobacteria. But, uh, you know, the crocs are then overwhelmed. And that could be another way of getting the, the, that classical pansteatitis disease. Also, you've got Massinger Dam, you've got lots of gill nets, lots of fish sitting, dying in that gill nets. And that, again, that rancid fish oil is sort of the classical trigger for, for the disease where the natural antibodies of the animal, of the crocodile, is just overwhelmed and resulting in pansteatitis. So maybe Donnie or Sam can say if they want to add on to that. My understanding is that they still, on the odd occasion, do get pansteatitic individuals in Kruger, not only in the early funds, but it's been also in one or two other systems, it's been recorded from, but it's not nearly as uh, as an epidemic uh, as it was in 2008. Sam, you are unmuted. If you wish to respond, I'll also check for Dani. Thanks, Chris. I, I'm sure Dani can also add, uh, add to this. I, I think one of the things that we did note, and, and Zander has explained the number of mechanisms there, we certainly did note when we were looking at these dead crocodiles, they were sort of different kind of dead ones, ones that are very nice and fat and other ones that are very uh, emancipated and stuff like that. So I think there are several mechanisms that might even be happening at one particular locality. Uh, but the, the, the ultimate uh, uh, aspect it is that it is a nutritional element that is actually driving these aspects. Uh, but Dani could perhaps reflect a little bit on some additional observations of mortalities that we observed in the last years or so. Thanks, Zander, uh, Chris, Sam. Now, Zander is right. You, you, you need a specific chain of events, uh, Janssen, which we had in the, in the olifants uh, when with the raising of the Masingir Dam that back flooded into the Kruger Park and when he changed the uh, normal pool rapid system that you found in the river to a deep water system. Now, of course, the olifants is a very polluted river and there's a lot of nutrients that come down with the water and now it's not flowing into Mozambique, it's now standing in the gorge, in a deep water habitat. Uh, all that nutrients uh, 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 stimulated the algal blooms that, 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 that Zander mentioned and of course the algae also take up these pollutants and then you get the filter feeder fish uh, populations blooming and the crocodiles overeating on that and of course with the toxins creating this inflammation in the body. Now what happened is then, then of course the, the, the years after that the, the, the salt that used to flow through to, to the, 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 the Mozambique coast got trapped in Masangir Dam and now with the raising of the dam wall got trapped into the Olifants Gorge and that made the water shallow again. Now, of course, now if you had shallow water, uh, you don't get this uh, algal blooms and you don't get the masses of, of, of fish feeding on them. So that's why the mortality slowed down significantly. But you do, we do find the odd uh, a dead crocodile and probably actually going tomorrow to, to the rangers reported one that we're going to have a look at. So it's not a healthy system. Um, the fact that the crocodiles are not dying anymore, only that that means is they've now, the population stabilized at a much lower level than we saw before that whole habitat changed as a result of the, of the Masangir Dam um, back flooding first and then salting the gorge up. Thank you. Thanks, Zani. Uh, Zani, if you want to add on, otherwise I think it's uh, Rod, who's next on your side? Uh, Campbell Scott. Right. Um, yeah, thanks, um, Sander. Very, very interesting. Um, I'm, I'm interested in long distance movements of crocs, um, uh, both over land. Um, and I remember years ago in Huangue uh, National Park in, in Anzim, some of those pan systems, you know, having a couple of uh, big crocs there, you know, um, how far have they been recorded moving over land and then, you know, both uh, up and down, you know, freshwater systems and then, of, of course, um, ocean-wise, you know, moving across to islands, that type of thing. So how far do these guys move from a conservation point? Mm. Right. I mean, thanks. Uh, thanks, Campbell. Um, the, in, terms of, in terms of the ocean, uh, there's, uh, the Australians have done a lot of really interesting work in, uh, 
you know, on the on, on Queensland side of, of that northern that northern section of Australia, where they've literally uh, put transmitters on a number of individuals and flown them with choppers hundreds of kilometers. And, and all of those uh, saltwater crocs eventually came back, um, often in, in, you know, in different uh, times. So, you know, it, it, it's not necessarily a linear movement back. Um, so, so that's sort of more for, 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 the, for the ocean movement. So um, in terms of uh, the Nile crocs, um, they definitely can move very far between water bodies. So when water bodies dry out, we know that they walk, they will, will always walk at night. Uh, often in terms of drought, like in KZN, farmers just report crops sitting on, on farm roads, just you know, uh, having sort of get caught by the light. They eventually will move when water dry up and they can't make a burrow. Uh, I've briefly mentioned that we've done this homing experiment at St. Lucia uh, in 2011 where we uh, moved a female from, uh, from a, uh, you know, the very southern section of, of Lake St. Lucia up to um, False Bay, and we, re we released her there at the height of the drought. So this particular female took 136 days to come back to the very same pool that we, that we captured her in the first place. And we knew of her home range because we were tracking her or at that stage already for two years. So we knew exactly where her original home range was. But what was quite interesting is that the lake was disconnected. So there were very large portions of dry land between the different water bodies. And what she would do is typically just sit in a freshwater pool for, for a week or two and then one night just walk 15, 20 kilometers over land. Um, straight to another pool and then sit there and repeat the way uh, that same methodology until she eventually, you know, hit Catalina Bay and then the narrow section where there was just continuous water and she was able to swim. So um, one thing with the, the, the navigational ability is without a doubt very, very interesting. Uh, Mexicans and the American people have put magnets on, on the heads of crocs and that seems to influence the navigational ability. So when you move the animal away from the, let's say the site of the conflict, for instance, with these magnets on their head and you release them then in another locality, at least on some occasions, they can't successfully home back, but they, you know, there's always exceptions. And there were some exceptions where they, even with the magnets, they did manage to home back. But in terms of movement, um, Definitely very far, I would say, you know, up to 20, 30 kilometers in, an, uh, you know, uh, over two or three days. Um, so definitely they got that ability. They, they got a very good ability to smell fresh water. So uh, that's also a, a key thing that when there's water, they will find the water. They just got an amazing ability to find water, but they definitely move over land for considerable distances. Yeah. Thank you. Interesting, thanks. Oh. Um, let's check if there are any more questions. Uh, um, anybody have any more questions? Yeah. Dr. Cheryl Ogilvy. Cheryl, would you like to ask your question? Hi, yes. Hi, can you hear me? Um, Zanga, I'm very proud of you. Um, I know you've been involved in environmental education for many, many years, and you know what we're going through to try to educate the masses. Do you think by interlinking the um, environmental or the crocodile issue into environmental education and into the school curriculum, do you think if we start educating the youth from a very, very young age, do you think we'll be able to save these um, species from extinction or do you think we can do it? Or after all these years, I mean, I've been in environmental education now since 1983. Um, do you think we can actually make a difference? Thanks. Uh, thanks, Cheryl. I think we've got to be realistic. Um, yes, I mean, my, my answer is uh, surely I think there they are many different ways, many different approaches to you know, bringing across the conservation message, but but we got to be also realistic. And when people and crocodiles interact, like in northeastern KwaZulu Natal, um, you know, we got to 
we got to think about uh, safety. So we got to, you know, we got to think about benefits to the people. The people need to see there's a clear benefit in having those crocodiles around. Unfortunately, otherwise, the reality is I'm not talking about officially uh, official protected areas. Within official protected areas, the conservation mandate is the conservation of biodiversity, and Nile crocodile is a top aquatic predator. So there, there cannot be any excuse for having, you know, um, very, very um, sort of serious efforts. But at the end of the day, you've got to get the people on board. And I think Nile crocs are, and, and the earlier you can do that, you of all people will know that, you know, you, the, the, the earlier you can catch the people, as in the kids, the better. You know, if you talk to them as an audience, there's a good chance that as adults, they are still going to be converted. But also, I think croc, uh, now crocodiles are a great model for a number of other issues, not only just the, the fact that we need to conserve them, or, um, but also, for instance, in terms of the, the whole ecology around crocodiles and the whole uh, economics. So the fact that people can actually be involved in ranching programs, in sustainable use programs, where you can bring in maths and you can bring in that whole side of it. Um, so, you know, they are, I think there's a lot of opportunities, but I think it is important that people are educated. We have a number of students, you know, uh, like Yanni that chatted uh, a little while ago that are looking at, uh, at people's perceptions of crocs, because there's a lot of misperceptions, there's a lot of miscommunication. Um, I've seen at Lake Sabai where someone is fishing, you know, half deep in the water, and when I ask him, you know, you are well aware that there are crocodiles here, why aren't, why are you fishing, you know, half deep in the, uh, waist deep in the water? And then his response would be, that, but the crocodiles on this side of the lake are not man eaters. He knows on the northern side there are problems. So, you know, people, there's misperceptions that can be clarified. And uh, I think there's a lot of um, very interesting, you know, different components you can add onto crocodiles or crocodilians as a group and bring that into education. But then you've got to translate it into Isuzulu or local languages. And, it, you know, it, it's going to take resources. And Unfortunately, often that's where it falls flat. Another question, unmuting you, uh, Cheryl. Hi, yes, Sander, then just a comment. Um, then I would love to know why South Africa has not interlinked these species into the curriculum because it should have been done a long time ago. And I've been fighting that for many years. And yeah, I think it's time now that we, we move away from the, um, I would say the traditional, um, the way we educate our children to bring in the environmental aspect and we should come in quite strongly now. Because if we don't start doing something now, we are gonna lose us and we're gonna lose our species. And yeah and then the impacts on the biodiversity. So yeah, thank you very much, Sandra. You have made a difference and even our students are listening tonight and thank you very much. Thanks, Cheryl. <laughs> ah, we have Campbell Scott has raised his hand again. Campbell is uh, never one to shy from asking questions. Mm -hmm. uh, Zanda, um, Campbell, if you want to go ahead with the second question, oh, keep it short. Eh? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'll try. Um, also, yeah, it's also on geographic distribution. Um, so genetically, our southern African population, how diverse is it, and how you know from a from a conservation point of view, uh, you know, are we are we are we are, in, you know, are there pockets that are inbred? What, what what's the status? Mm, thanks, uh, Campbell. Um, there was a paper that came out earlier this year, exactly sort of talking to that point. Um, and yeah, I mean, it's, 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 you know, it's kind of hard to tell. Uh, we don't really think that there's a huge genetic variation within Southern Africa for a number of reasons. Well, first of all, yes, you've got there's certain river sections that's never been sort of connected, but because of restocking, I refer to the fact that Tony Pooley restocked Lake, uh, Lake St. Lucia, restocked in Dumu Game Reserve, um, you know, problem crocodiles get released in sort of more official conservation areas. A lot of the croc, 
the crocs that we used as breeding stock in South Africa came from Botswana. So some of those crocs then escaped into the wild. So what I'm, what I'm trying to say is that it, it's a bit of a mess, actually. So there's, there's actually been a lot of almost unnatural movement uh, because of um, buying for breeding stock, uh, crocodiles escaping into the wild. Um, I, I think, you know, so generally it seems like there is not a lot of, you know, uh, difference between, uh, from, a, from a genetic point of view, within South Africa. I know the authors made a point in that paper that for some reason the Botswana and the KZN population is very similar. But my personal opinion is they're very similar because the breeding stock that's in KZN, a lot of that came from Botswana. They, they obviously also sampled at crop farms. They didn't do the sampling in the wild. So they, there's a couple of issues with that particular paper, although you know, so there's actually a need, to be quite honest, what you are raising is something that we've talked about. There's a need for a thorough study for genetics for Southern Africa to try and get to grips with, you know, you know how different are these various populations. But unfortunately, because of um, restocking and because of, of, of buying a stock, breeding stock for crop farms, uh, unfortunately, you know, it, it, it's, it is a little bit of a mess and there are a lot of interlinking between these populations that supposedly are fragmented. Thank you. Um, it seems like let's take a last question. Um, then, uh, Dani, if you would like to make any final comment on anything that was said or Sam, and then closure from Sander. The last question from Papa Arov. Papa, um, I'm muting you. The, the, is the skin trade supplied only by the croc farms? And, and how big are the population? How, how many crocs are in the croc farms? If there were no croc farms, would the crocs be even, you know, be in a much, much worse? state are the croc farms preserving the crops yeah so i mean no that that's a very important point i mean we, we did talk about the the fact that numerous populations were virtually extinct by the sort of the 1950s uh, the the croc farms played a hugely important role in in supplying the the, the market with with farmed skins um and and therefore you know reducing the, the, the pressure on the wild crocs. But in fact, at that stage, you know, there were so few wild crocs remaining that it wasn't economically viable anymore really to hunt them. I mean, they, in, in, in Botswana alone, they estimate that up to 80,000 crocodiles. Now, it, it's a bit much, it probably is closer to 50,000, but still, that's still a lot of crocodiles that were shot and not all of them were retrieved. So, you know, people get a quota and they would, they would kill half of the crocs and then the other half would die later on somewhere else. But they, so what I'm trying to say is that, yes, the, 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 the farming industry plays a very, very important role. In fact, there's, in South Africa, there are no wild crocs um, whatsoever, you know, harvested for, for farms. Um, the, 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 the quality of these skins are, incredible so even the croc farms struggle you know a lot to get to this incredible quality that's demanded from them there's a lot of pressure specifically europe so in the east uh, you know they the, the quality is still high but it's 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 not as high as as as, as in as in europe but uh, maybe i could just mention that in the states like for instance alligators and for instance in south america with a the caiman they um, there's, there's, there's a lot of ranching taking place. So landowners that, that go and they ranch the eggs from the wild, so not farmed animals, from the wild, and those eggs are then incubated and they are supplied to the industry. And the, because of that, in, because of that money that's flowing back from the industry to that landowner, those, the habitat is preserved. So those, those came in, uh, you know, habitat is preserved and it really, really plays a very, very important role in terms of the conservation of those wild caimans. So, so there the emphasis is a, a lot less 
on the farmed animals and a lot more on wild populations. But in South Africa, we, we only supply the industry from farm crops. And there's about 80, 80 odd farms in South Africa, of which I would say there's about five that's really big, uh, really, really big commercially. Unfortunately, at the time, you know, it's a really bad time for crop farming with, with the prices being what they are. And also there's a lot of pressure, as you might be aware of, from the animal rights uh, groups that's, that's really making it really, really hard for, for crop farming. Uh, and, and with some really negative consequences that feeds back now to local people that rely on that, on that income. But, but that's, I guess, a debate for another night. But I, I can't tell you offhand, maybe Christine Lepai, if she's still on, have a better idea, but it's, it's a few thousand, uh, um, uh, quite a few um, hundred thousand uh, growers, because you've got the breeders, your breeding stock, and then you've got your growers. So it's a couple of hundred thousand, um, but maybe Christine's, Christine's got a better uh, grasp on the, maybe the number of skins or something that's exported every year from South Africa. I, I don't have that figures in front of me. Christine? Um, yeah, thanks, um, Sandra. In fact, uh, Pippa, it's a really interesting question that um, in South Africa, when we talk about farming, we're talking about captive breeding. So there's a total disconnect between the crocodiles that are bred and raised on the farm, which is basically a captive breeding centre, and um, the populations in the wild. So whilst Zander has rightly said that um, having the farming situation in South Africa has taken the pressure off the wild populations, uh, we've got to the certain stage where the Nile crocodile is, um, I wouldn't say safe, but it's certainly there are some very viable populations throughout its range in Zimbabwe, Zambia, etc. Um, where there are ra ranching programs and the ranching program relies on a healthy, viable population in the wild it's a it's a it's a conservation tool that's used for crocodiles um, and works very successfully through programs such as campfire um, where monies go back to the local communities who live alongside the crocodiles so in south africa <coughs> we've talked about this just recently there's been a really um it's been really badly hit by the global market um for crocodile skins um, where these classic skins, the, the, the buyers, the main buyers, such as Hermes, uh, Gucci, etc., are demanding real perfection. So um, the South African industry has sadly been really badly affected by this. And uh, a survey was carried out about a year, two years ago, and yes, there were 80 farms, but we had our little regional meeting recently, and yeah, I mean, half of that's gone, really. People are actually almost just giving away their eggs and their hatchlings because there's simply no market left, which is quite tragic because it is, as I say, a valuable conservation tool. Uh, monies can be put back into conservation. Um, some of the crocodile farmers, captive breeders in South Africa are members of the Crocodile Specialist Group and contribute to research projects. So it is a valuable tool, but um, the data is really, really poor at the moment. Um, and of course, it has been a pretty shocking year all around for, um, for most industries and crocodiles included. 